Thank you for coming inside on this beautiful day. It was very generous of you to leave the sunshine and uh, welcome to our own sunshine here and, uh, and hear from me today. So uh, I'm gonna talk, uh, uh, the title of my talk is How Will We Handle a World with No Normal? Preparing for a Changing Climate. So I'm gonna dive right in and uh, actually begin by giving you a little background about myself and who I am. Uh, I am a child of the Pacific Northwest. I grew up most of the time in Seattle um, with a father who is a physicist at the U and uh, spending a lot of time in the mountains, woods, and trails of the Northwest. What's really interesting to me is understanding how a place works, how um, the global environment affects the local environment and why it matters to those of us who live there. And I have really vivid memories of doing homework as a child and trying to you know, explain my math to my dad and I'd be like, I understand it, I just can't explain it. And he would say, you don't understand something if you can't explain it. So um, now I've been doomed to spend my life trying to bridge the science and practice gap, trying to translate in both directions. So you can judge for yourself how far I still have to go before I really understand things. So I, as Sunshine said, I'm the director of the Climate Impacts Group. It's a group at the University of Washington that's been working for 23 years to connect science and decision making. And our aim is to understand the local impacts of climate change. We do science on the um, local impacts and then to work with regional managers, planners, decision makers, elected officials to apply this information in the decisions that they're making now. So a lot of the work that I'm talking about here represents sort of projects that we've been working on over the past 23 years and a bunch of the partnerships we have in the Pacific Northwest. So I wanna just begin by reminding us that climate's fingerprints are everywhere. And we can see that when we go up in space and look down at the planet. And this is my home, the Northwest, Washington State here. And you can see that we got really two very different climates here. We've got the uh, windward side of the Cascades where it's wet in the largest temperate rainforest on the planet. And then we've got the leeward side, which is actually a high desert. And um, this is easy to tell from space, and as you get down lower to the ground, you see the fingerprints play out in what grows where. This is just to give you a little tour of my neck of the woods from, the, again, these big, enormous um, rainforest conifers to our snowy peaks, um, salty ocean shore, and then higher, drier sagebrush desert. But the climate fingerprints are deeper than, of course, our natural ecosystems. They are also manifest in what we grow where, where we think it's safe to live, and what kind of places we build to live in. So here, I think I stole this from Sea Grant, um, coastal Rhode Island, and a very different house you might live in if you lived in the Arizona desert, right? So, duh. I mean, what am I, I'm telling you something you don't know, but I want to begin this way because these are the obvious fingerprints of climate that we know, but th there's much less obvious ones that are embedded in all aspects of our lives. And the reason that climate change matters is that what we thought of as normal when we developed our society and our infrastructure is changing. And unless we update ourselves to keep up with that, we're really gonna be in trouble. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of the specific ways that these climate expectations or our historical definition of normal are embedded in society. So I'm gonna just talk through some of the important systems in our society, beginning with water. And again, these examples are all um, from the Northwest specifically, but they pertain to much of the Western US and actually much of the world. So humans have built our water management systems to smooth out the vagaries of climate, right? Why do we have dams and reservoirs? So we can move water from when we have it, but don't need it, to when we don't have it, but we need it in time, right? So we can have um, water that's delivered in the wet season available for us in the dry season. Um, we have built our agricultural system, especially irrigated systems, to depend on a certain amount of water that's available at a certain time, and our water rights are all organized around that. And we've built our drinking water systems and other aspects as well. Our power systems also have deeply embedded assumptions about climate. 
in much of this country, power is produced by hydropower. In the Northwest, it accounts for 70% of our power. And uh, that its production and its timing, it, again, depend on those dams and reservoirs, when water is flowing down the streams, and also the laws we have embedded in our Congress that mandate how we are allowed to run those reservoirs when we're allowed to let water out to make power. So we don't have a lot of flexibility in money aspects of the uh, management, and that's because we designed something that we intended to be resilient to the climate of the past. This also comes up when we start thinking about um, alternative um, climate-related ways of generating power. Um, our power systems are predicated on our assumptions about our historic and projected future demands, but often those are predicated on an assumption that the climate isn't changing. We might have more people or more people who want air conditioning, but we often assume that the temperatures aren't changing. That's an important driver. It's even embedded in how utilities think about how they need to maintain and operate their systems. Infrastructure. We think about dams, I've already mentioned, but also roads and bridges. Those are designed. Engineering standards are based on historical data about how much flow there'd be in the river, how much runoff you'd have down a hill. They are sized to be built on specific historical events, the 100-year flood, for example. Our seawalls that are protecting many of our downtowns in our major urban areas, this is Seattle, has a major seawall down here holding back um, the Puget Sound, which is actually crumbling and is being replaced, but that was designed to account for a specific height and a specific tidal range. So these are all ways in which we've are committed ourselves to expectations about what the climate has done and what it will do. It also comes out in more operational ways and sort of seasonal activities. So we work a lot with national parks who are, face, are really starting to think about what does it mean when our, uh, the seasons change. So a lot of these, and, and by that I mean sort of an extended warm season. So a lot of our parks and campgrounds are closed in the winter seasons. Um, the parks and forest service hire seasonal workers to open the campgrounds, rangers to help people on the trails during the summer season, okay? But with less snow and longer seasons, um, that whole employment cycle changes. Um, Wildfire season is traditionally sort of May to November is the longest one, depending on where you are. And again, these agencies depend very much on seasonal workers, often summer college students, right? And then we have more subtle things like toxic algae. So there's algae blooms in Lake Washington and Puget Sound. I don't even know, you guys must have some here sometimes. And uh, those are seasonal as well. And the State Department of Health monitors are um, shellfish for safety, right? And then they post notices when it's not safe to eat. But they monitor, I hope that's not mine, um, they monitor during a specific season when they expect that toxic blooms may happen. What happens when those toxic blooms happen when they're not looking for them? So embedded in what I'm saying is that, you know, normal, what we call normal, increasingly isn't normal. And as we go into the future, it's really not going to be normal at all. And yet, in, hidden inside, not only what kind of house we live in, but a lot of things that we depend on are these assumptions about normality. And so let's talk a little bit about how normal isn't going to be normal anymore. So as you all know, right, the global climate is changing. We've changed the atmosphere in ways unprecedented over almost uh, you know, 800,000 years. Our global climate is changing rapidly compared to natural variations, and this pace is only going to increase in the future. We've committed ourselves to centuries of change, right? And you have probably seen lots of graphs like these over the week, I don't know, but basically under all scenarios we look at, we expect continued global warming, right? So this is a figure showing, you know, observed temperature increase of a little over a degree and a half, almost two degrees over the 20th century, and then various different projections for future temperature. This is actually degrees Fahrenheit. Um, by the 2080s, you know, half to three degrees warmer if we go undergo unbelievably aggressive emission reductions and even start sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, or if we don't change anything at all, 
um, five to nine degrees warmer by the end of the century. So real changes set in motion, real changes that, you know, by the 2050s, we're gonna be in a world that's unlike the world we've seen in the past. And as I've said, we've committed ourselves to centuries of this change. If we stopped our emissions today, we would still see warming for hundreds of years and sea level rise for thousands of years. So, the good part of this figure is that there's two different lines here. And one of them warms a ton, and one of them doesn't warm as much. And that's a choice that we as a society are making and are continuing to make every day. And that is, I think, one of the most urgent choices we have in front of us. And what I'm going to talk about is the other part of our choice about how we deal with climate change is thinking about what are the impacts. Because as I said, we've set change in motion, right? We are already experienced warming. No matter what happens, we're going to experience some warming. It's going to change our normal climate. And that will disrupt our alignment you know, with our climate system. And I want to talk through some of the ways we need to think about bringing that into our daily lives as well. So why does it matter? What's it? Well, the climate change, the projected changes that we're expecting over the next handful of decades. I'm not talking about out in 2100. I'm talking about over the next you know, um, 20, 30, 40 years. So let's go back to each of those systems that I was talking about, and I'll talk a little bit more specifically about what we know about these changes. So broadly, we know that climate change will alter water availability around the globe, and kind of, you know, strangely, it will actually both increase the likelihood of droughts and floods. And the shorthand we use, I use at home when I'm talking to legislators, is, you know, more water when we don't need it, and less water when we do need it, right? And that's, um, in particular, in the Northwest, like California, climate change means a big reduction in our mountain snowpack, and our mountain snowpack is our natural reservoir. And the fact that we have a mountain snowpack as a natural reservoir meant that we didn't build very big dams and reservoirs. And so that means that we have likely summer water availability problems. And so if we continue to operate these systems as normal as in the past, we're setting ourselves up for some major challenges. So power, climate change will affect energy supply and demand, as well as the, as the lifetime and performance of capital infrastructure. And so uh, again, uh, supply and demand, supply is obvious if you're talking about hydropower, right? Really big changes in the amount and timing of stream flow, but also um, changes in wind patterns and important um, impacts on supply. This lifetime and performance of capital infrastructure, I mean, if you're a power system geek, this won't be surprising to you, but I didn't know about this, right? So transmission efficiency decreases with heat, right? So it's harder to decrease, uh, transmit the power. And um, I never really thought about things like wildfire and their implications for our power system, right? A lot of uh, problems with wildfire in the West end up burning the transmission lines, which are um, another risk that rural communities face and then also another risk of a cost of recovery. So infrastructure, climate change will increase flood risk in rivers and along coasts. So both, there's sort of three major factors influencing uh, flooding especially in the Northwest, but on any coastal areas, obviously we have sea level rise projected um, to continue and accelerate this century. Um, we also have increased heavy rainfall, which can cause localized flooding, and then in some cases increased flood risk in rivers. So in places like um, the Western US, again, where climate change means less winter snowpack, it's still gonna be precipitating, it's just gonna be warm, Right? So instead of collecting as snow, the rain comes down the rivers, which can increase flood risks. And so this has implications for what the size of the 500-year floodplain is. And this is why we were talking about the FEMA risk map, or I was talking about the FEMA risk maps today on our, on our um, field trip, which is that they have typically been designed accounting for historical floods, and they define an area of risk that does not include the increased risk around climate change. 
So then also we see that climate change, I called it, uh, will lengthen what I called the warm season. I was gonna say it'll make seasons change, which it does, you know, sort of spring coming earlier, fall coming later. It doesn't actually change the equinoxes, but it makes you know, frost-free season longer. And so for example, in my example with Washington Department of Health and their monitoring, they have actually realized that climate change will cause some of these blooms to happen earlier at times when historically they haven't been out checking for the toxic blooms. So they've been expanding their monitoring season to account for that. So this is my attempt. I'm not the VR guy, right? My attempt to have a, a kind of cute graphic, which is my, my analogy for what we're doing when we're thinking about the climate of the past and we don't even know we're thinking about the climate of the past, right? We're just uh, running our systems and uh, you know, running our society as we thought made sense. It's as if we're driving down the road looking in the rear view mirror, right? And in fact, the road ahead, a little more rough than we might expect. And um, our job in my group is, is to help um, governments, agencies, communities and businesses uncover these embedded climate assumptions and see how or whether they need to be updated to account for the reality of the future we expect. And um, so we, our work runs the gamut from sort of the motivation of this is why it might be a problem to you to actually talking through with folks what they might be able to do about it. And so here's the part that isn't quite so gloomy where uh, I think people are always surprised um, when I tell them how much we know about what we expect to happen in the future. So I would say we know more about the future than you may think, and I think that most stories that I read um, in general about climate change are sort of at a global scale, you know, how much is the planet gonna warm, maybe at a national scale and sort of some particular events, like maybe the Texas drought was more related to climate change, but often it's kind of about polar bears and wildfires somewhere else. And what I think people don't know, which is really important, is that we know more about the future than that. There's been a lot of work looking at what the local impacts of climate change are. So you can take the global climate models that scientists use, and you can do regional climate modeling. And so this is that same kind of graph about how much it's gonna warm, but this time it's for the Puget Sound region, like of the Northwest part of Washington. So it's not for the globe, the nation, or a state, it's for a region. And we then have also developed this wealth of information about what the downstream impacts of that warming and the projected changes in temperature, uh, precipitation and sea level rise are. And this is just to give you an example of this tool that managers in the Northwest are using. This is a little Google map interface. Actually, this isn't just the region, right? This is whole sort of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, California, little Nevada, showing um, locations on rivers, specific river locations, where we have projected future stream flow under these different climate change scenarios. So um, this isn't just like it's gonna get a little bit warmer and I can show you a map that's kind of orange or red compared to now. This is really specific stream, projected future stream flow at locations that dam and reservoir managers are using to make their management decisions. Um, just to give you one more example of the kind of information we have, I was mentioning those sort of three factors that contribute to increasing flood risk. And for a number of rivers in the Puget Sound, sort of Seattle, general vicinity, we've looked at the combined impacts of sea level rise, the heavier rains, the declining snowpack, and looked at specific river locations and specific time periods in the future to say, to project changes in flood frequency. We also have projected changes in low flow frequency because it's the low flows that matter for other, other systems. And so it's not just a matter of all these sort of general bad things are gonna happen about more droughts, more floods. Um, it's actually to the stage where in many locations, this isn't the whole world, it's not even the whole US that has this, um, but in many locations, we have very locally specific, sector specific information that can be used in risk assessment and planning and decision making. <laughs>
Uh, so one example of that are these are two maps. This is um, the city of Olympia, which is the Washington State Capitol. This is the city of Seattle. And in both of these cases, these are downtown maps looking at different areas of the um, shoreline at risk to flooding from different amounts of sea level rise. And again, this is not unique to our neck of the woods. There's been plenty of this work being done in the Northeast, in Rhode Island, in Boston, in New York. But you probably know those examples, and I wanted to bring you the ones you don't know that are from the, the other side of the country. And so the point here, again, is that there's pretty specific information about how big the risks are, what's at risk. And the other interesting element of this slide is that both of these figures were made by those cities. They weren't made by scientists trying to like, tell somebody who's not listening that this is an important issue. This, this is made, um, these are made by the two cities and are used in their own planning. So uh, as the last part of my talk, I, just, I wanna talk a little bit about giving you some specific examples of what it looks like to sort of update our, opinion, our vision of normal and uh, some real world examples of people who are trying to build these specific climate information into their decision making. Because again, the, the, the point I think is really important here is that there's, there's lots of decisions going on and lots of actions being taken every day that are determining our future risk to these changes in climate. The bridges we build, the roads we build, the land we preserve for habitat on the coastline, all of these things are either going to be vulnerable or resilient to these climate changes, depending on if we plan ahead. And so our goal is to get ahead of it for those parts of the change that are inevitable and um, to ensure that um, we come as close to being resilient as we can. So one example is from the small city of Bellingham, Washington. It's north of Seattle and Puget Sound. It's where Western Washington University is. Um, and it's a site of a, um, a, a previous um, pulp mill on, on the Puget Sound there. And it was a big tailings pond or holding pond, Georgia Pacific pulp mill incredibly polluted site right on the downtown edge of the Port of Bellingham. And um, the, the Port of Bellingham uh, engaged in, and the city of Bellingham engaged in a redevelopment project where they envisioned a whole bunch of things. One is cleaning up this toxic site. And then the other is opening up the shoreline to the city because it's one of these sort of working port towns, right, where you couldn't really get to the water side unless you were um, working. And so they have developed um, a new, this is their development plan, which is actually under construction. I just only have the architectural drawing that um, was part of a large community process around you know, re redesigning. What do we want? We want connectivity. We want gathering spaces. We want you know, live work. We want you know, good business stimulus. And we want this to be um, resilient even as sea level rises. And so they use sea level rise projections in their design and grading of the site. They did a lot of really smart things. They have a lot of low-lying land right on the current shoreline. And for in those places, they put sort of um, less valuable uses, docks and small marinas that are updated or rebuilt more often that aren't huge capital investments. The big um, construction of condos and other major um, commercial properties, they put up hill. And they actually made the hill higher so that it, it's um, large enough to accommodate the projected sea level rise. So another example is from our State Department of, of Ecology, and they're the ones in charge of um, what, what I call state Superfund cleanups, right? So there's the National Superfund program, but then within each state, there are toxic sites and there are state agencies that are responsible for cleaning those up. And so their, their job is to isolate the contaminant and to protect human and environmental life forever. And then when you think about that and you think about you're gonna protect something forever, a lot of these sites are on rivers or on the coastline. Um, they're susceptible to risks from sea level rise, flooding, landslides, even some are um, threatened by wildfire. So we have 
have a colleague, a woman who's a toxicologist in the state, the toxics program in the State Department of Ecology, and she was thinking about how vulnerable these sites are and the kinds of things that can happen, like this site on the Sound that had, uh, I don't, something like two 100-year storms within a couple of months. This is actually a toxic site that's underneath the gravel, underneath a cap, got totally um, uncovered um, in the storm. Sea level rise is an interesting one because it actually, you know, as it infiltrates into the ground, it changes the buoyancy. And so fuel tanks actually can pop out of the ground um, when, when that happens. So she got really, really concerned about this. And she said, we are in charge of doing this stuff. We are designing and implementing new cleanups all the time. And we really ought to be thinking about the fact that the environment is changing. And so she lobbied for a couple years in her program. Her, her boss finally let her, her um, do this. And she developed this guide, um, guidelines for designers, ad adaptation strategies for resilient cleanup remedies, which is, I think, one of the first in the nation, where it's step by step for people working through this process. How do you incorporate climate change? And then a whole bunch of the online data, that are like the ones I was showing you, showing where are the flood risks? How big is the sea level rise risk? Which of these things do you need to incorporate? So um, I think this got a lot of extra attention after Hurricane Harvey flooded all of those Superfund sites in Texas. And um, I think just this realization that um, if they had been well designed, they may not be well designed in a changing climate. So another example, I don't know if you saw about saw this is in the New York Times in the AP this week. It's about um, our s salmon in the Northwest. If you know salmon are an endangered species, they're iconic, they're super important for regional economy, and they're incredibly important for the Native American tribes. And um, the Tribes sued the state of Washington several years ago and because there are many of these culverts or water crossing, you know, there's a road crossing with the water going under it, um, structures that are not salmon friendly. This one has the salmon going up the stream, but they can't get up the hill to go up to upstream to their habitat, so they all stop here. And this is one of a whole lot of reasons that salmon populations are in trouble. And the courts found that the state of Washington had to replace all the fish blocking um, culverts, which is about 1,000, and to, well, it cost about $2.4 billion. And the reason it was in the paper right now is that um, there was an appeal, and uh, it didn't go any. The state appealed. There was a tie, so the Indian tribes were favored, and so the state of Washington still has to fix its culverts. So um, our State Department of Ecology, again, and our State Department of Transportation are actually thinking, well, if we're going to spend $2.4 billion replacing culverts, maybe they should be the right size for the flows of the future. Because we have data that show that in many locations, the flood flows will increase 20, 50, 75 percent in the next 50 years. And the expensive part about replacing a culvert is not the size of the pipe. The expensive part of the replacing the culvert is shutting the highway, digging it up, and putting the pipe in. So um, this is an example of you know, a long-term investment where they're actually thinking of what the conditions are going to be. And so that's my last one, which is this example of sort of what does resilience look like? I would say spending public money once or spending it right. And this is an example from another um, Washington city, the city of Anacortes, small community, but um, this is a drinking water treatment plant for the whole area around it. It's right on a river, which you can't see um, in this um, dark slide. And our research has shown, again, that the flood risk in this river is increasing quite a bit with climate change. And not only that, but more sediment will come down the stream. Um, and sedimentation is a huge part of the, or desedimentation is a huge part of the job of this treatment plant. And so this treatment plant, which has now been built, $56 million water treatment plant, was designed differently to, to accommodate this increased flooding and this increased sediment load. And um, we had this field trip today to the FM Global where they were talking about how you handle floods and the different things that you might do. And it, it was pretty interesting because um, this plant has uh, concern about their electrical um, power and controls. And so they put them all on the top of a little hill. And um, if you remember, the guy said, I, one of the strategies for dealing with flood water is to waterproof your 
your entity, and he didn't know many examples of that. So the city of Anacortes, actually, this water treatment plant actually did make a watertight treatment building. They built, designed it like a ship, um, where the whole first floor is watertight with no, uh, what do you call them, punctures. Uh, it's not called a puncture. No holes, no doors, windows. They're all on the second floor. Uh, so there were a couple examples like that of how they designed it differently. And this um, quote I really like from the public works director where he's showing our governor around. We were embarking on building a large facility, an expensive facility. I didn't want to waste people's money and have to replace it or remodel it in 50 years. It's going to be here for a while. So some of the folks in this room are the scientists and researchers, or maybe they just, you know, friends of them. Um, and I want to suggest that um, a lot of this work to develop local resilience to climate change, but really to any serious environmental issue, requires what I would call a new approach to science, not to say that there's probably not a lot of people, there are probably plenty of people in this room who would do it this way, but it's not the mainstream approach to science. So I suggest that doing this successfully requires this, uh, what I call collaborative science, where we co-define the problems that are worth solving, right? So it's not scientists sitting around thinking just themselves about what would be interesting, but also working with practitioners to understand what current challenges are and where knowledge could be used to further um, adaptation. And then in some cases, it's co-produced. Some of this science that we do can't be done without participants from practitioners who actually you know, provide the data and knowledge about how their system works or what the real legal or policy um, context is that a uh, solution has to work within. We need to both advance understanding and enable action. This is one thing that's, I think, a little bit unique about groups like ours, and I think Sea Grant is another example of this, where it's not just about building the knowledge and the understanding, like in step one, but it's also about supporting its use. And that's a whole nother step, which is being around to answer the phone in a year when somebody finally has the political well in their department to implement the solution you guys worked on, and they have a question now. And um, in you know, the traditional science world, we might have already moved on with another grant, be like, I don't work on that anymore. I don't have time to talk to you. Um, so it's a real different commitment to being there to enable action. And then it's locally specific and decision relevant, which doesn't always get you published in the fancy journals. Because science, so many times, success is about our, the big picture and things that are generalizable and transferable. And especially in the climate world and in so many other issues, right? What you can do is very specific to the place you are. What are the specific risks there? What's the specific context? And making a difference means, you know, doing science that's specific in that way. And so um, I've mentioned our group. We are not, of course, not the only group that does this. There is um, a USGS-funded program. This is the other center I direct called Climate Adaptation Science Centers. And there are eight of these around the nation, so every part of the country is served by one of these, and their task is to develop decision-relevant science, in particular for uh, lands, resource managers, cultural resource managers, Department of Interior um, sort of priorities. NOAA has programs that fund this, um, the Sea Grant program and other programs, and then there's plenty of other sort of local university teams who are doing this specific science. So although all my examples are from my neck of the woods, um, there are plenty of other groups like ours around the nation, sort of depending on wherever um, your interests are. I think it also requires a new approach to decision making, one in which we actually acknowledge that the climate change context and the implications of our decisions on climate change and of climate change on our decisions. And so this is a recent, um, just, just one recent example from things I've been working on. The Washington State Recreation and Conservation Office, I had to write down the number because I'm not gonna remember. Um, it it, it um, gives out about $60 million every year in funding to support recreation and conservation. So that can be infrastructure, sort of roads and trails and campgrounds. Conservation is often habitat protection or ecosystem recovery. And they started thinking, well, wait a minute. We're investing $60 million a year. And these are supposed to be projects with long-lasting benefits. 
Are they going to have long-lasting benefits? Are we investing this money wisely? So their board had this memo. You know, the board has a fiduciary responsibility to ensure wise investment of grant funds. At a minimum, a funded project should not significantly add to greenhouse gas emissions, and the impacts of climate should not negatively affect the state's investment. And I would say, so this is aspirational to them. They don't, they made this declaration, and now they're trying to figure out what the heck that means. How would they know if they're in, you know, I think that adding to greenhouse gas emissions, while that's not easy, that's the easy part of this, doing that math and figuring it out. The rest of it is more complicated, but um, they're gonna begin with one part of their program and start thinking through of all these risks of a changing climate, which of them are likely to affect their investments and how would they know and what are they going to ask their um, grant applicants to show to demonstrate that um, the state's investment will be well placed. So in the end I, I've started thinking about like what what can we all do I mean I think some people are in professions um, or are, are placed because of maybe their um, involvement as a citizen in planning or decision making that has a long-term impact and they can really think about how are we including this climate information in it. But I think all the rest of us can ask these climate questions too in our, in our personal lives or in our, our reporting lives, right? So how does this action contribute to or reduce climate change? How have you adjusted this investment or this activity or the decision to ensure a successful outcome even as the climate changes? How do I know you're spending my money wisely? What did you assume about the future? And is it realistic? And you can make a big difference if you do this. So one of the national forests in Washington state is like 6,000 acres. Is that right? It's gotta be more than that. I forget how many it is. O Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest over on the east of the mountains. Um, it was the first national forest in the nation to include climate change in its national forest plan. The national forest plans are done, I think it's every 20 years, and they guide everything the forest does. Why? And they included climate change in this in the 90s. And why did they do it? Because they had scoping meetings, right? They begin by inviting the public to come and say, what's important to you about your national forest? What do you think we need to worry about? What are you doing about it? And they heard from tons of people the question, what are you doing about climate change? Climate change is increasing wildfire risk. It's increasing flooding risk. We want to know what you're doing about it. And it was because of that demand and that question, what are you assuming about the future and how are you coping with it, that actually took them down this road. So, um, I think the, the happy thing that I think that very few people maybe realize is how much work is going on in our agencies and governments, and in some cases, the very long-sighted businesses about thinking about climate risks and, and um, how to adjust what they do. When I talk to people on an airplane about what I do, and they're like, oh, that must be so depressing, and then after I agree with them that it's very depressing, and that um, it's kind of a hard job to have. They say the happy secret is that there's tons of work going on in this. And so I think our other task is to actually hold up those examples and celebrate them and normalize them. Because there's plenty of communities that don't want to be the first one. They don't want to be the weird one that does this kind of planning or takes this new step. But it turns out they're not the first one anymore. The first ones have already stepped. And so it's more of a story of there's these other examples and why aren't you too? And here, and people learn better from their peers than from others. So there's, you know, I think there's a lot of momentum to come from daylighting um, this work. And many times it's done, as you can imagine, it kind of quietly, because there may not be perceived to be much public support for this. And so I think a lot more can happen if agencies um, and individuals perceive this support. And then finally, my last sort of reason to have these up here is that, you know, the poll results, some poll, polls sometimes show that one of the reasons people aren't really that worried or motivated around climate change is they're like, you know, if this were really a real issue, 
then the people in charge would be doing something about it. <laughs> right? I, I mean, I'm not, I, it's funny, but I'm not making a joke, right? Like, we look around at the people whose job this might be, and it's not them who are t saying this is a big deal, it's other people, and they're not taking it seriously. And, you know, although my talk is all about the impacts and what's set in motion and what we're going to do about it, and it's not about the really bigger part of the problem, which is way more important, which is how are we going to, you know, bend our curve and um, reduce our emissions. There is something to be said for showing that people who ought to be worried about this are worried about it and are acting on it. I think that is my last slide with my contact information. And thank you again for coming inside on this beautiful day. Are there any agencies uh, helping to do funding to redirect uh, corporations more so in energy providing um, industry to start creating some federal grants or r money resources to change the um, financial goals of these companies to assist in renewable energy sources? Well, I don't know a lot about that. Um, I would say that the, the whole issue of motivating different energy companies to invest more in renewables is a pretty complicated subject wrapped around you know, the subsidies we have for different forms of fuel um, and uh, the non-level playing field that currently exists for different kinds of energy sources. So um, I would say that one of the big reasons that, I mean, I think we all know that there's been, there's a lot of reasons why there isn't a lot of action on climate change, and one of them is that some um, uh, pretty powerful entities have a lot to lose. What, what agencies would you suggest um, federally and environmentally to start getting some game plans to make a push on these corporations to do that form of change to cut the CO2 emissions down? Well, I think this is really a um, problem that needs to be addressed, you know, in Congress and at the top levels of government because agencies, as we have seen, the EPA has done what it can under the Clean Air Act, for and we have people here who know more than I do about that, um, but uh, I think they're the, they're, um, the limits of what can be done without new legislation or policy, uh, we're pretty close to those limits. In, in my imagination or, or vision, would be to start trying to, and you probably have a lot of the connections, I'd like to try to get some from you before you depart, but ultimately getting environmental groups to inspire legislators to start redirecting their plan of action because I think that other than automobile use to switch us over to electricity for that form of propulsion, considering that's a large portion of the CO2 emissions in our country, that uh, I think that it's a real strong, important thing that people get involved to try to use the resources for the environment and uh, environmental scientists such as yourself to form together and trying to get some established legislation and or some agencies established that are going to help do this push. Yep, those are important points. You touch on many of the reasons this is a hard issue. Yep. Hi, um, thank you for this interesting talk. Um, I was curious about um, the one example you gave of this uh, town uh, that decided to uh, recreate its, its coastal environment. Um, so w I'm curious as to what is the story uh, that kind of 
you know, propelled or was the catalyst behind that this, this decision. And I'm particularly curious because I, my understanding is that uh, a lot of large uh, American cities and, and you know, cities around the world uh, will have uh, the right expertise and the right data to, to uh, go forward with uh, and plan resiliency projects, but uh, smaller uh, towns often don't have the data and lacks the expertise, lack the expertise and, and the expert essentially. So. Uh, that sounds like a great success story that I'm curious about. Yeah, so uh, I think the original impetus for the Port of Belling or Bellingham Bay Redevelopment Project was frankly the fact that there was a um, shut down toxic site, former pulp mill on the shore that was an eyesore that prevented people from getting to the beach and it was you know, a contaminated site that people wanted to clean up. And um, and when that kind of thing happens and a community comes together to vision what it would like and what its priorities are in that site, um, you know, being resilient to climate change or you know, dealing with sea level rise was somewhere on the list, but it's not, it wasn't necessarily the community's priority, right? The community's priority is having a vibrant place to be and good places to live and you know, a nice marina they could use. But the, port, the engineer and the planner for the port of Bellingham was familiar with sea level rise projections and research and concern. And you know, that was because of our group and the fact that we've been working there for 23 years. And part of our job were, is actually to make people aware of the risks and provide data to, to use in planning. And so, um, ha however, this is an example where it's kind of low tech. I mean. The, the design and engineering aren't low tech, deciding how to grade the site and what is an appropriate height and everything. But you know, he just got our general sea level rise projections and from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report too, and is like, uh, you know, three feet, okay, let's make it better than that, right? So it, it for some of these, I, I'm being obnoxious, I'm sure it was more detailed than that, but it didn't require a study. It didn't require any new analysis from us, and it didn't require any new analysis from him. He used projected numbers that are not particularly specific, but were good enough, and then they put in the free board, you know, the, the room that they needed. And so I think um, having some locally specific data is important. Um, I think equally important is having the locally specific awareness, or the local awareness. Um, uh, around the issue, and um, I frankly don't know the details of that story as to whether it was hard for him to like get that in there. Um, you know, he describes their port culture as designing for the future and having a long, uh, you know, a long time horizon. So often it's places like that where, you know, you can really, where where people's job is to think long term, and there are clearly long term implications of climate change. So it's a good map. Right. So Moody's announced in January that they're going to begin to use uh, a city's ability to deal with uh, climate change and the shocks of uh, extreme weather in their ratings. Mm -hmm. And so this is a way that cities are going to be motivated to try to come up with, uh, at least respond to that. And I really like how you're looking at how public funds are part of the whole equation. I'm also wondering about the use of things like Fannie and Freddie mm -hmm. for home mortgages. Everyone who gets a home mortgage, which is a 30-year investment, is backed by Fannie and Freddie, and that's government money. And if these homes are going to be underwater within that 30 years, you know, there should be some sort of acknowledgement of that in the mortgage. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I think, so first of all, long term, or, or um, not long term, but big picture, yes, right? I mean, the way we move through this is we actually really have our eyes open to what the risks are, and we actually you know, choose how we're going to address them. If I choose to put my big house in the floodplain, but I have enough money to build it again myself every time it floods, okay. But if I put my house in the floodplain and ask you to rebuild it for me every time it floods, maybe that's not so okay, right? So that sort of knowledge and then disclosure and documentation, I think, is a super important path forward. I think like getting there from here is challenging for a bunch of reasons. One is that we haven't done, we, the royal we, haven't done the analyses to actually have reasonable risk maps like across the country for those purposes. 
And then we also have these other ways we prop up risky investments, like our flood insurance program. Right? So. Oh, I want to say one thing, though. I just learned something super cool about what I think it was approved, or I'm looking around for someone who knows this. But um, the, uh, so the Rhode Island Coastal Commission, is that the right name? Thank you. I knew it ended in C. Commission, council, committee. Um, sorry, I'm making myself resonate here. Uh, just made or is considering uh, a regulation that when a homeowner or property owner gets a permit for an activity in the coastal zone, right, like within 200 feet of the shore, I'm making up the numbers, don't quote me on any of the numbers, um, then they have to consider these climate change scenarios such as different sea level rise scenarios in, in the impact of that on the proposed project for which they're getting a permit. And then record what they chose to do in their deed or property evidence or whatever the thing is that passes to the next owner. So when the next owner wants to buy it, or the next buyer, right, they can say, oh look, you looked at the scenarios and saw that it could be this much sea level rise and you chose to ignore it and build your this there. And that was a risk you were willing to assume and I don't want to assume that risk because it's documented in here. So that's another example of, I mean it's not exactly the Freddie, you know, but it's another example where I think daylighting what the risks are um, is a really important step that actually can have a lot of power. So. I, uh, I was very impressed with that uh, water treatment facility in Anacortes and with the forward thinking going into that. But do you have any idea how much of that $56 million price tag was, uh, was with this forward thinking? And is that an uh, impediment to other communities doing this? You know, that's a terrific question, and I don't know the answer, but I want to, so I'm going to go email Fred and ask him, uh, Buckenmeyer. Um, I, I, I do know that they had experienced some flooding before. Right, and so there's a there's a picture of the old site, uh, the old building where you can see the hundred, or they or they at least knew that the hundred year the previous hundred year flood was pretty dang high on the building above any of those penetrations. That's the word I was looking for. Um, so uh, it wasn't a, uh, the design changes were not completely unwarranted based on past experience, which would be a reason that he was able to get them through, right? And this is one of the things, often climate change is increasing risks that we have experienced, and so those can be used as motivating factors to ameliorate them. So the specific question of how much, I don't know. Um, one of the, I mentioned the sedimentation problem. They have a huge sedimentation problem right now where they have, I mean, not problem, but that's just, you know, you see the photos of the before and after water and one is just dark brown and one is, looks like you want to drink it. And so they have major water settling ponds that they use and those, you know, take a lot of energy to clean out because the guys go in there and shovel them out. And so they put more in. So all these things were sort of making, climate change will make existing problems worse and they could have just replaced in kind to deal with existing problems and it would have been kind of okay. But is an addition, but I, I actually want to know, because that's always the question, right? Spend a little more to save a lot later, and then, but we rarely have actual numbers for that. I wonder if you have any thoughts for uh, us about how we might cover this story on the East Coast, where so much of the coastline is privately owned and very valuable real estate. And I ask that because just yesterday I was in Fairfield, Connecticut, where the houses were destroyed by Hurricane Sandy six years ago. And astonishingly, they are all rebuilt four stories high with a, uh, a garage level that the tide can wash through. So they're right in the same places. The entire, it, all the houses are back where they were. And, and the town rebuilt their own pavilion in the same place, and you know, I'm not really covering that aspect of the story, but I just was uh, struck by how Bellingham is saying, oh, build back from the, where the sea reaches, and obviously Yankees don't want to build <laughs> back from where the sea reaches. Well, and to be fair, nobody had a house there yet, right? There was a contaminated <laughs> pulp mill that no one was living on, so nobody had to move, right? And that, that is the hard part, nobody, um, I mean, it, this isn't easy. Right? Um, 
I would say, I'm just a firm believer. I mean, call th this, it, I was going to say call me naive, call me hopeful, but I, I really think oh. that we have to be clear about what some of these risks are and then make, um, increase the alignment between those who bear the risks and those who get the rewards. So if you want to build your house there and you put it on stilts and the sea wall comes, the sea comes under it, what's wrong with that? I mean, that's your, I don't have to bail you out. Um, you didn't put up a big old wall that has ecological impacts, right, by destroying habitat or by causing increased erosion to your neighbors. I mean, the armoring and the, you know, having to rebuild, rebuild are costly, both ecologically and economically. I'm not sure that having your sea water go under your house is that much of a problem. I mean, that's one of the design responses to um, rising seas, right? And to think about um, if you're designing a waterfront park, how can it handle occasional flooding? Um, so that the floods can come, then the floods can go, and then we can go back and use the park again. So um, I think we're going to have to do some combination uh, of those things. Of, um, and, but we will get to the harder stuff where there aren't the sort of simple, simple solutions like raising your four-story house up in the air. Hey, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this.